fire starting steam engines, ravenous red deer and orange inflatable angry men. Some of the things that deer managers can't control are the likes of what's just appearing behind us. It's all part of a year in the life of Highland Sport. Hot sheep, not a specialist interest spin-off, just Roy getting on top of the foxes. Again, not another spin-off. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. In my lifetime of being in this area, this is probably the 15th or 20th time this piece of ground has been burned. We're in the Highlands at the beginning of May and Neil Rowantree is letting off steam. Some of the things that deer managers can't control are the likes of what's just appearing behind us. Now you may ask what this has to do with Highland Sport. Well, quite a bit actually, as coming down the line is the Jacobite steam engine. Scotland's West Coast Railways line, historically famous for transporting stalkers to the hill, is now better known for transporting Harry Potter to Hogwarts. But there is a problem. This wonderful symbol of national heritage is destroying another. Right, where we are here, David, we're on uh, the top of the Ardneish Peninsula, and this is in West Inverness. What we've done here is worked hard to reduce deer densities to a level that permits regeneration and permits a lot of the restoration of habitats that currently tick all the boxes for government. In the past, the, there was funding in place for controlled burning on the railway sides, particularly on steeper slopes where the engine was working hard pulling the carriages so that uh, fires couldn't get out of control because it was minimal fuel load. Whereas if you look around behind you here now, up on this slope above you, that, that's been burned to the cr a crisp last year. Within a mile there's been another big fire. And all the way along this stretch of the line, valuable, fragile habitats are being burned on an annual basis. And, and nobody really seems to want to either care or do anything about it. Hope doing that way. To my mind, it strikes me as incredible that in their deer plans, they aren't taking this into account. There has to be some kind of mitigation for them, that if landowners have done their very best, and other activities neighbouring the land cause the vegetation to be burned, they can't be held responsible for it. So the deer managers reduce deer numbers to save habitat. The protected habitat is destroyed by wildfires started by a steam engine. This is ignored by government, which looks at the scorched earth and tells deer managers to shoot more deer. Back on Ardnamurchan and the deer in his park are still getting supplementary feeding. It's 2018 and this last winter has been the worst for a generation. It started raining in June last year and forgot to stop. It's not just been a bad winter for deer, it's been a bad winter for sheep. And uh, people have had to work hard to keep feeding going for the cattle as well. And these are maybe one of the things for climate change that we're just going to have to be aware of is that uh, as the climate gets wetter, we're going to have more challenging winters. The, the hill deer, we stopped feeding them about two weeks ago. But with the pear david and that in the park here, we, we keep the feeding going on as the grass is away in the early part of May. It's been a slow late spring. So we basically monitor them for consumption and if they're still coming and taking it, we'll keep it going. So probably another two to three weeks of this and then it'll slowly fade out. So we've gone from feeding every day now to every other day and then uh, we'll slowly fade it out, so by the end of this month the feeding in the park will be over too. But the mineral tubs will stay out for them right the way through until they finish growing up. Neil has some advice for anyone feeding deer. The main do's and don'ts is if you're going to feed them, feed them something that it's worth feeding them. Don't feed them something that makes you feel good and doesn't do them a lot of good. 
people will feed them a lot of things like there's a lot of people feed them tatties and uh, I'm not a great believer in feeding tatties to deer because they don't have a lot of value in them they're just bulking the animal and uh, not giving them a lot of benefit and the other thing I would say about feeding deer if you can avoid feeding them on the ground in the same place avoid feeding them on the ground in the same place because what you'll get is you'll get quite a build up of parasites particularly when a lot of deer are congregating in an area and you can very quickly increase parasite burdens, particularly worms. So it's an error to keep feeding them on dirty black ground. So we make the point of feeding them up off the ground where we can. The other thing is to make sure if you're feeding a lot of deer, give them at least at least 80% of their daily uh, requirement. And then it's worth the investment of their time and energy to be there. There's nothing worse than keeping deer in a place and not feeding them enough. And then the other thing is looking at the weather and the conditions and the condition of your deer. If you've got it in your head that you've only got enough feeding to keep them going till the end of February, beginning of March, and March and April are particularly bad, then don't be shocked if you go back to a feeding area and find deer lying dead. Because if they've become habitualized to feeding in that spot, then you've got to keep it going. And two things I would say about feeding them. Feeding shouldn't be used as an excuse for overpopulation. Feeding should be used to enhance the performance of or to divert deer away from places. I wouldn't support it as an action just to keep higher numbers alive. May is not a time for shooting deer, so Neil's Blaza R8 only comes out for fox signal for dealing with marauders. What are you doing here, boys? What we're doing now is a great example of modern kind of kit, modern technology on the go. So this thing, tack driving the Accurate with a Leica scope on it. But we've now got to the time of day we want to do something else. So now switching to the Pulsar thermal sight. And again with the blazer because it's all sort of modular stuff, it's so much easier to do. Just a couple of quick turns of the lever. And that's that thing now ready to go again. So we'll put the magazine in the bottom, a couple of rounds in it. Just to double check before we do it, weapon's clear. We can take this, pop in the box out the road, lift the spotter out. You've been enjoying your thermal kit. I must be honest, I mean, I, 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 the more I use it, and the more I speak to colleagues that use it, the more I think that there's a couple of things that I, I think for what we're doing it is absolutely a game changer. I mean, you don't disturb wildlife half the way you do with a spotlight. And a lot of our foxes, I mean, we don't have a big fox population, so I mean, a lot of our foxes are quite shy to get to grips with. And uh, we've gone from having foxes you couldn't get a hold of because they were lamp shy. This year, the dens, we've had 100% success on everything. So I'm, I'm highly impressed with it. It seems like a lot of money, but I think if you do have foxes, you need to control. And you want to monitor, I mean, as much as, as culling stuff for the site, the, the, the spotter, just to see what's going on. I think uh, modern deer stalkers and gamekeepers, it's, it's an invaluable piece of kit. I think within a few years, it'll be as commonplace for you to have it and use it as it was uh, 50, 60 years ago for people to start using binoculars. May is also a time for new life. The sheep on the crofts are starting to lamb, but they're vulnerable. Not to foxes, Neil's taken care of those, but sea eagles. Many still deny that the enormous raptor introduced to this part of Scotland takes the newborns. The crofters and Neil no different. This is rewilding for real. It's messy and there's conflict. One way of dealing with it is this, a big orange terrifying flappy inflatable designed to send the apex predator away, possibly to think hard about what it's done. There you go. It's difficult not to find it all a bit comical. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Neil, what is happening? That's the angry man. He looks like a drunk man, not an angry man. Well, the wind's pushing that one over, but that's the idea is it leaps up and there's a whistling noise. Listen. That's it. That was it? That was it. And that would have done what? Well, the idea is that if the sea eagle is in the area hunting the lambs, that the angry man popping up, whistling and waving his arms around will be enough to deter the eagle from hunting the lambs on the, on the bank. 
to me, it generates a whole host of questions, David, because, I mean, we've known for a long time that, uh, well, certainly for the last 10 years, that the amount of impact of sea eagles on lambs here has been steadily increasing. We're also aware that the sea eagle population itself is steadily increasing. And uh, there's been a very long debate that sea eagles don't take perfectly healthy, viable lambs. But I think for the majority of people, other than the sort of the environmental evangelists, the, the fact isn't really challenged now. So the idea is that products like that will reduce the impact on lambs by disturbing hunting birds away from lambing areas. I hadn't really seen this device in use before, but it's in a couple of places on the peninsula this year. And we're just getting into the key time now for lambs being predated on by the eagles. So let's watch and see what happens. I think a decent gale of wind, if he rises up at the wrong moment, he might end up malig. <laughs> angry man flying. Uh, you might end up with an absent man rather than an angry man. Do you think that's then acknowledging an issue? I think yes. The field staff that work here with the sea eagles are pretty level-headed people. They're working within the confines of law. I think that they're doing their best, but I have never had a conversation with them in which they've said to me that eagles don't take lambs. I think it's about how they manage the issue. So whether angry men are going to be commonplace or other things are going to take uh, a hand, who knows. One word of caution, if you Google inflatable angry man, you won't get the result you expect. To complete this trip to Ardnamurkin, Neil asks ecologist Dr Cathy Main to show us the work, as required by government, that she's carrying out on the estate to monitor grazing impact. From my perspective, the habitat is the foundation on which everything else depends for its its uh, nutrition, its capacity to survive, and if, if that is incapable of doing the job, or it is being used in a way which is not sustainable in the long term, then that's bad news for the future. So I look at the habitat first, and that then determines what level of herbivore impacts can, can be tolerated. Uh, and deer will tend to take these. The sheep don't like them, but they do take the foliage which the deer tend to avoid. This area will tolerate a higher level because there is better bedrock, there is better nutrition in the soil, and it grows better biodiversity, if you like, in places which have a very acidic bedrock you wouldn't get the same diversity of plants, you wouldn't get the same amount of green stuff for herbivores to eat. <laughs> Interrupted by my assistant, as ever. <laughs> Neil's also told us that she's no tree hugger. Yes, I, I confess I enjoy hunting. I feel very respectful about taking a life, um, but I I have learned to do it because I understand the need for culling. I understand the need for a population that is capable of decimating the habitat it lives on without careful management, having lost its predators. Um, and if I think that that needs to be done, I need to be willing to do it myself. And in the process of learning what that means i've actually discovered that there's a you know there's a kind of primeval bit of me that quite enjoys trying to get into the head of a deer you know where will the deer be today what will they be doing um and and that's a that's a very uh, basic part of human makeup which i think a lot of people aren't in touch with anymore and it allows you to move through a landscape and enjoy a landscape in a, in a very different way as well. I've always walked the hills, I've climbed, but I've, I've never moved through the landscape as if I were a hunter, as if I were looking for dinner. Um, and that's a, that's a very different view. Um, and I, I like it, I must admit, yeah. My job here today is to put in some permanent sample plots for habitat impact assessment so we can look at the impacts that we've got and, and how they will change through time. And then we'll come back to the same place next year, the year after, and repeat that survey and see how, how that's changed. Um, and, and in this location, it might have changed quite a lot. The sustainable rural economy 
Is it about deer? Is it about agriculture? Is it about forestry? Is it about ecotourism? It's about all of those things and, and a, in a lot of places there's conflict between the objectives of all of those. So whatever the broad policy of Scottish Government is, which is to secure the land in a good condition for its people, as I understand it, um, how that's delivered on the ground is always more complex than any broad sweeping policy can identify. Springtime is a time of birth and death. April is the cruelest month, said the poet T.S. Eliot. Next time we join Neil in the summer when he can start getting the best out of the spring survivors dealing with marauders and terriers. Fascinating stuff from Neil and from Cathy there. And I should say that thanks to our filming and because local landowners and deer managers got together, plans are afoot for a diesel engine to help the steam engine up the steeper parts of the line. Well done to all involved there. Now, someone else who needs a shove in the right direction, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Farmers are becoming increasingly angry about the number of lambs being lost to eagles, but they still don't have the video evidence they need to prove that it takes place. A viewer from Ireland recorded this golden eagle on a wildlife camera, but there's no indication that the radio tracked bird has done any damage, only found a cheap meal. Meanwhile, Natural England has issued a licence to allow the release of 60 white-tailed eagles on the Isle of Wight. It claims it paid attention to impacts on other wildlife and livestock, and it carefully examined the potential risk of lamb predation. Tell that to the Scottish crofters. The case is more open and shut with foxes. John Bailey of Bailey Shooting and Country Wear shot this fox that was carrying a dead lamb. Anti-grouse shooting campaigners accidentally killed young birds as they protested on a moor. A group of people walked through the middle of Walshaw and Lancashire Moor to highlight how gamekeepers carry out pest control, which they oppose. But after finding a legal snare, they ended up driving ground nesting birds to abandon their nests. More anti-grouse shooters have been whipping up anger in North Yorkshire over a dead buzzard. They shared this x-ray showing metal particles in the buzzard and gained the support of North Yorkshire Police. UK shooting organisation Basque has asked the police to confirm whether the buzzard was shot or if the metal is ingested shot, passing through the gut from scavenged roadkill. Unmanaged land in North Yorkshire caught fire during the recent dry spell. Moorland near Liverton started burning with local gamekeepers pointing out that if controlled burning had taken place, establishing fire breaks, it would not have got out of control. RSPB members are leaving the Bird Rights and Welfare Organisation because it kills birds. The RSPB is concerned that the breeding population of the curlew in the UK has halved since the 1990s, so it started culling vermin that eat curlew eggs and chicks. It kills around 500 crows and around 400 foxes a year. This has led to hardline RSPB members resigning in disgust. Tensions have spilled over, with one RSPB warden having to apologise for telling critics they were knuckleheads and nimbies. Malta will not allow turtle dove shooting this season. The Prime Minister has announced that quail shooting can take place this spring season, but turtle dove shooting cannot, despite the turtle dove conservation measures put in place by Maltese hunters in recent years. A pond in Nottinghamshire has been drained because of the threat posed by goldfish. The fish have bred and multiplied over the years after being dumped into the water as unwanted pets and they started outcompeting local wildlife for food and living space. The pond was drained and the company responsible says that all the fish were rehomed. Londoners are to be introduced to the joys of ratting via an exhibition. The story of Tiny the Wonder, a champion rat-catching dog in the 19th century, is now to be told in an immersive show at the Museum of London. The Manchester Terrier was once celebrated in the city of London for being able to kill 200 rats in an hour, and now, alongside a fox, a horse, a pigeon and an elephant, he is to be celebrated once again in the show Beasts of London, billed as the first to look at the history of the capital city through non-human eyes. It runs for the rest of 2019. 
A hunter has been allowed to use a hovercraft while hunting moose in Alaska. The US Supreme Court overturned a legal victory by the National Park Service against John Sturgeon of Anchorage. He had hunted the animals for 40 years along the Nation River, a waterway within the Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve in northeastern Alaska. He's been fighting this case for eight years. And finally, a couple of heartwarming dog stories. An Inverness Coast Guard helicopter crew out training were offered the perfect exercise. In an unexpected test of their winter flying skills, they spotted a small dog that had been missing for 48 hours in the terrible weather conditions of Storm Gareth. Ben, who is a Cavachon, a mongrel King Charles Cavalier Spaniel and Bichon Frise, was rescued but was terrified and cold but has made a full recovery and has been happily reunited with his owner. Meanwhile, in the south of England, our own Paul Childley had two spaniels stolen from his kennels last week. Thankfully, both Copper and Fudge have been returned. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now a quick shout out to our Dutch viewers. David is holding his film workshop days in the UK. He is also, thanks to Igor Timmermans, editor of Vibrance Heil magazine, holding one in Rotterdam on Friday the 17th of May. If you'd like to go along, visit vibranceheil.nl for more information. Space is limited to just eight people. Now, something that's quite tricky to film, it's nighttime fox shooting, especially when they're lamp shy. The last um, month or so, I've been blocked away at home working with the birds because it's uh, spring is in the air. We've got eggs appearing, we've got lambs appearing, and when you've got lambs appearing, that can only mean one thing: that old Charlie boy will be appearing behind them. And I don't mean Charlie that we've got with us. I mean the foxes are, are back out, and we had a, a call from the farmer here because in the last couple of nights he's lost about seven lambs. So um, he's asked us if we can get out and uh, try and take whichever beasties are causing the problem. You doing any foxing without thermal these days, Roy? I tell you, it's very, very strange. I mean, I still prefer, I mean, we're scanning with a lamp now just to see if we get any eye shine because it's still a little bit quicker than scanning with the thermal. I still really enjoy foxing without thermal and without night vision, just doing it with the lamp. But it is so, so much more effective, especially when you're yeah, you've got to get on top of problem animals because it does it does the job so effectively. Yeah, it is incredibly effective. Um, but it's uh, yeah, <laughs> I do feel I, I, it's the first time I've ever felt sorry for foxes because um, yeah, they really don't stand a chance half the time. Any particular call you need to find? Yeah, there's a um, a vixen distress call which seems to be working really really well at, um, at this time of year. Um, I think where they're they're very, all the foxes tend to be very territorial. Um, it brings both dogs and vixens at the minute. Um, and it, as I say, it does work incredibly well. We should park the car just behind a tree there, so it shouldn't be silhouetted. I'm gonna just tuck up here, turn the cooler on, give it five or 10 minutes, and then if we don't get anything from here, then we'll move on and just keep moving around the farm. So um, I would have thought the foxes could, or whichever fox is going to be causing the problem won't be too far from the field so uh, we'll just try all the little shores and all the little coverts and see where we get a response from. He read the script and knew what he was doing. That fox it was uh, walking down with a limp, so uh, obviously I felt a little bit of empathy for it. Um, but, uh, so uh, he started um, heading down, and again, I mean, that was my fault. I just put that caller just a little bit too close to the wood, and where he was, I mean, he was perfectly within range, but unfortunately, there was just too much scrub in the way, there was just a few branches, um, and it just wasn't worth taking that shot. 
um, and risking it. So uh, because again, you could have just lost the bullet into the branches and not had a clean kill on him um, or her. But um, and then it wasn't interested in the mouth calls. It's just hanging back, back up there. So uh, we'll just skim round this little wood and see if we can pick it up with the thermal on the way through. Um, but again, I mean, it, uh, yeah, the thermal worked superbly, but unfortunately the plan didn't quite make out. We were just set up here calling and I was just expecting um, a fox to appear just out of this thick thick grass here or possibly from the wood over there. The wind's straight in our face and it's quite a brisk breeze as well so I don't actually know if the, the call is punching out there, I would have thought so, but you just never know when you've got a, a good strong headwind like that how far the call's going out. Um, and you've always got to be careful when you have got a strong headwind um, that something's going to come in from the sides. You can pretty much discount anything coming unless they're completely stupid or they've, they've lost their olfactory senses. Um, you can pretty much forget anything coming from behind. But obviously that one couldn't get behind us. It was just following the, the fence line down um, and didn't realise it. I mean, it can only be, I would have thought, 30 odd yards away. Um, and again, just we're completely dark. Um, we've, we've got no moon. It's uh, absolutely pitch black. So it didn't have a clue um, and just was coming bimbling straight into us like that. So, uh, you know, very pleased we've got that one. Um, we're just going to head back over into the sheep field um, just to approach it from the other direction and, uh, and just see if we can uh, pick up another one in there. But you know, so, as I say, it's, um, it is just a, a constant battle, um, especially when you have got lambing going on because they will just keep coming in and keep coming in. And it, again, I mean, you can't blame them at the end of the day when you've got uh, all of the smell of the afterbirth and everything going on, then it will attract foxes from quite a way. So that turned out to be a, uh, a barren vixen. Interestingly though, I would say she's obviously helping another vixen with cubs because you can actually see there's some little marks just on her nipples there. So um, cubs have obviously been trying to feed there, but where she's barren, she's, she's obviously got no milk, so they wouldn't be her own cubs. So you've got the two spots there where the cubs have been just getting into her nipples. You can just see the fur's out of place and slightly discoloured there. Um, so she's obviously been yeah, going in and, um, and probably helping supply food to the, uh, the litter. Um, you know, it, she could be um, helping her, her mother or, um, or possibly a sister. Um, you know, litter mate from uh, from previous years, but uh, you know, very very interesting there that she's um, she's definitely been about cubs, but they're certainly not hers. Again, we've lost a few lambs out of this field here, um, and so we know the foxes are here. But fingers crossed, we'll get a good response from this one. Is that it coming through now? <laughs> just came in, um, just straight into the call there. He actually went down, down into the, um, the hedge line there and then came back out um, and straight to the call um, and just managed to shoot that one there. So we'll go and pick that one up and I think we'll call that a night. Thank you to Roy and Charlie. Patience pays off. Next up, our global trawl of the best hunting and shooting videos on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Seven Valley Ratters promises and delivers Mayhem in the Bales. Episode 5 sees 166 rats killed. John Bailey mentioned in news is clearing rabbits for a landowner using a POD 007 on his CZ45522LR and only the onboard infrared. Gamekeeper John recommends slingshot hunting pigeon catch and cook by Jofi Slingshot Hunting. All meat eaten not wasted, says the channel. In the hunt, Wyoming Coyotes 2 from Get Zone is calling them in after 
after a spooky animal makes them and shoves off, the outing starts to get better. American Air Gunner is on a helicopter feral hog hunt with an air gun. I think that's a first. Quite a lot of chat before they get going, but good to establish the backstory, and then it's a yeehaw fest. Yacht Laggett Camp Wilderness series hits episode 2. The Norwegian TV show is after reindeer. Decoying partridges with partridges is a thing in Spain. This 20 minute documentary in Spanish shows you how. Might not be entirely to your taste, but it's what they do. And finally, lots of anti anger about polar bears hunting by foreigners. Here's how the locals do it, and they eat them too. William Larkin Jr. gets a license and is out on East Turnavik Island. That's it for this week. I put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Something else that might take your fancy, it's Field Sports Ireland. Thanks, Charlie. Well, every year a wildlife sanctuary in Kilkenny have a pigeon problem. Who do they call? The Jenkins Town Gun Club. The Gun Club guys go in and roost shoot the pigeons, and for Field Sports Ireland episode 8, I join them and find out a little bit more about the NARGC and the Gun Club system in Ireland. I also hark back to the end of the pheasant shooting season, and we're on a keeper's day in the Shelton Abbey shooting, County Wicklow. And with the clay shooting season just around the corner, I catch up with Richard Foles, who's setting the course for the 2019 ICTSF World Championship in Mead in July. Welcome to Field Sports Ireland. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, our sparkly new website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And of course, you can pop your email address into our constant contact form at the bottom of the front page. And we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can find out about the Field Sports Nation, how to back us. Visit fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares. For that one, I'll see you next week. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing. And goodbye.